I want to give a talk, so I was asked to give a talk for a general audience, and that's what I intend to do, so all the technical terms that Artemio was telling you, some of them are behind what I'm going to say, but I'm going to keep it at a minimum, although if, uh, if I was going to really name the talk, so to turn away the general audience, this would be the, the, the full, full depth of the talk, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you will see that, but we'll see it in, uh, mostly in pictures. Um, so, first of all, as, our, uh, uh, as Jesus mentioned, uh, we, we are at a meeting, a number of the people in the audience are at a meeting to honor uh, Liz Mansfield and Peter Clarkson on the occasion of their 60th birthday. Um, so, this, the talk is a little hard. Oh, I see. Oh, I thought I had another slide coming. Uh, the talk was a little uh, hard to develop because weighing speaking to experts in the area at the same time as keeping it at a fairly general level for a general audience is a little challenging and hopefully I will make at least a modest attempt at, at rising to the challenge. So some of this will be uh, well known to the experts um, but occasionally I'll show a slide with some mathematics on it so if you're a non-expert and the mathematical slide comes along, you can take a very brief nap, but only very brief because it'll only last for a slide or two. Vice versa, if you're an expert and, and, the, and the mathematics is trivial, you can take your little nap. So, so we'll have different parts of the audience napping at different times. Um, so let me start at the very beginning. And so what I do all of the things that Artemio mentioned have to do with symmetry in a, in a fundamental sense. And what we learn, what mathematicians learn, starting with Lagrange, Abel, and Galois, is that symmetry has to do with group theory. So I want to start out by giving you a very quick survey of groups. You, you already, even if you're not a mathematician, you've, you've seen groups in elementary school even, as we'll see. Um, their fundamental importance in mathematics is, I, I like this quote from Alexandrov, a Russian mathematician, next to the concept of function, which is the most important concept pervading the whole of mathematics, the concept of a group is of the greatest significance in the various branches of mathematics and its applications. In a certain sense, if you understand functions and groups, you're a long way to understanding most of modern mathematics, one might say. <laughs> a little bit of a stretch. So let me give you the, the definition of a group, and then I'll illustrate by very simple examples, and gradually we'll build the geometry, we'll come into it. So please bear with me. If you don't like the algebraic formulas, they'll disappear pretty soon. Um, so a group is just a set with a binary operation. So this is a definition you would see in a mathematical textbook. In fact, it's probably in, in at least one of my books. And it has what you learn in school, uh, do they to, still teach this? In, in my era, it was all associative, commutative, all of these things. So it's associative, it has an identity element, which doesn't do anything, and it has an inverse. And the main thing about groups and the things that make them really powerful is they're not necessarily commutative. The simple examples are, the harder ones are not. In other words, it matters what order you do things. So. Here's an, the example you learn in uh, grade school. The integers under addition form a group. So addition is the group operation. The identity is zero, because if you add zero to a number, it doesn't change the number. And the inverse is how you get back to zero. So if you start with seven, you add minus seven, and you get back to zero. That example is commutative. And then you move on in school, and you start learning about fractions, how to add fractions always challenging because all the students just want to add the numerators and add the denominators, of course, but it doesn't quite work that way. Um, but anyway, when you learn how to do it properly, it still forms a group the, uh, with addition. The identity is still zero, and the inverse is still the negative of the fraction. Or we can do a different operation. So a group has an operation, but usually referred to as multiplication, but in the first examples, it was addition. So if I take the positive rational numbers, that forms a group, a group now under multiplication. If I multiply two positive rational numbers, I get another one. In fact, that's much easier than addition because then you'd really do work numerators and denominators in the right way. The identity now is not zero. That's not even a positive rational number, but is the number one. And the inverse is now, instead of being the negative, is the reciprocal. So the power of mathematics is to take everyday examples like this and generalize them into an abstract concept uh, 
And then you start finding more and more examples, but once you learn to work with the abstract concept, you, your results will apply to lots and lots of situations. And that's kind of a theme of the talk. Uh, of course, then you go on further in your studies, you get to real numbers, infinite decimals, like pi and square root of two, so you can multiply. Again, this case, the group operation is multiplication. And here we start to get, so this is getting to be about one of the most mathematical of the slides, not the most one, but so, so a group that we all like a lot, and this is the first example of a, a non-commutative group, is two by two matrices. So just like with rational numbers, when you add them, you don't just add numerator and denominator. Two by two matrices are just arrays of four different numbers. Here they're just called A, B, C, and D. And the operation is kind of strange if you've never seen it before, but is very important in all branches of mathematics. This is the start of linear algebra, as it's called. The identity matrix has this form, 1, 0, 0, 1, because if you do these weird operations and multiply E times G, you get exactly back to G again. And the inverse is this funny matrix. And the non-singular part is that what's called the determinant of the matrix has to be non-zero. That's like being positive for the rational numbers. Okay. So if, if you're, so as I said, we'll go back to pictures immediately. This talk will be like this. Every time I build up to a mathematical slide, I'll go back to a picture or a movie or something. So, so as I said, symmetry is based on group theory. That was one of the fundamental understandings of, of in the start of the 19th century. So I'm going to show you examples of symmetry, but let me give a, a rough definition. A symmetry of a geometric object. So take your favorite geometric object, a square, a cube, a sphere, whatever, whatever you like, tetrahedron. A symmetry is just a transformation that preserves it. In other words, doesn't change the object. And the set of all symmetries of a geometric object automatically forms a group. So, in other words, and what is the group operation? It's composition, or in, in more down-to-earth terms, mathematicians tend to like to work from right to left when they write formulas like this. So this means you first do H, and then you do G. Um, and for various historical reasons, this is the way it's done. Um, so we first do H and then do G. So if H preserves S, and G, then we get S back again when we apply H. If we then apply G, we're back where we started. We apply G, we still get S. So it's obviously a symmetry. So the composition of two symmetries is a symmetry. The identity, which is just do nothing, that obviously preserves. So you always have the identity as a symmetry. Any object has, has that. And this is important, so it seems like this is trivial, you, shouldn't, you should ignore it, but no, it's, it's important. And the inverse of a symmetry, if you undo the symmetry, you go backwards and you started with S, you end up back with S again. So there's the mathematical definition. The group is, I'm going to denote by G sub S occasionally when I have to refer to it. Okay, so this is a little bit of an interactive talk. So from the audience, especially the non-mathematical members of the audience, so what are the symmetries of a square? So who wants to tell me? This is worse than going to, I, I've given versions of this talk to high school and junior high school students, it is worse, they were more reactive, symmetries of a square. Nobody? No? <laughs> so you, you have rotations by 90 degrees, by 180 degrees, by 270 degrees. And don't forget, I said there's always one symmetry everything has, no matter what I showed you. One immediate answer you can just say is the identity. <laughs> so that's a group that's often referred to as Z4. There's also reflections. So if I reflect about one of those four axes, I still get a square. So it's maybe clearer with the vertical axis than the diagonal, but you can see you reflect on the diagonal, it brings square comes back to itself. Okay, good. Okay, we'll get more into So these show up, these type of symmetries show up the, in various applications, and one of the ones that the mathematicians like to study is what are known as wallpaper patterns. So, so intuitively, we can see symmetries in here. There's certainly a reflectional symmetry, say, about this vertical axis. Um, there isn't a symmetry about the horizontal axis because, of, because these are not, are not symmetrical that way. Um, there's also a translational symmetry. I can move this pattern from here to here. And one of the things mathematicians like to do is classify objects, say symmetries. 
And so the symmetries of a wallpaper pattern, there are in fact 17 types. And there's a famous example of this right here in Spain. The Alhambra has all 17 types. And my wife, who's also a mathematician, we'll meet her later in the talk, um, every other year she takes students to Spain and Greece and Italy on a one-month course doing symmetry, art, and architecture of uh, various cultures. And one of the things they do is they go to the Alhambra and the task is for the students to find all 17 of these wallpaper patterns. I think one or two of them are quite hard to find, uh, but they are there. So you, so you can imagine what sort of symmetry is there. There's another example from the Alhambra. Um, and one could do sort of 3D versions of this. So crystallography, the study of crystals, is basically, from a mathematical point of view, a study of symmetry groups. So now we're in three dimensions instead of two dimensions like the wallpaper patterns. And it turns out there are 230. These have been classified by mathematicians and crystallographers. So that's, so you can see it can get already in three dimensions, it gets to be quite complicated. Um, other types of symmetries. So this is a famous mathematical object known as the Cox snowflake. This is what leads to a fractal. Probably met, most of you have heard of the term fractal. So you start with a triangle. On each straight edge of the triangle, you erect another equilateral triangle. So in the next stage, you get a six-pointed star. And then on each edge of the star, you put another triangle. And as a mathematician, I can go all the way out to infinity. I can do this infinitely often. And I get something that looks, this is a little bit better picture of it. And this has a symmetry. Well, there's certainly a rotational symmetry there by 120 degrees, but there's also a scaling symmetry. If I look at, say, this little part of it and I zoom in on it, it looks exactly the same as that part. So scaling symmetry is when you look at a magnifying glass or, a, or through a telescope or something like that. And there are examples, of, well, that's a regular snowflake. Here's a, here's a tiling from Esfahan in Iran that one might say has some sort of scaling symmetry that goes along with it. Okay, so there are examples like that. There's a lot more. Here's another. So the most mathematical of the artists is a, is a Dutch artist named Escher. And many, probably many of you have seen different versions of Escher. This is an example called Circle Limit 4. So there are angels and devils here. And there's clearly something symmetrical, because you see the angels and the devils are getting smaller and smaller and smaller as you go out to the edge. So there's some sort of symmetry. And this is an example of what's called, so I'm not going to define this officially, but it's what's called conformal symmetry. And it plays a very important role, not just in art, but in mathematics, particularly in number theory. OK, but those aren't the symmetries that I've worked on during my career. And they're not the symmetries that will play a role so much. Well, they will play a bit of a role, but not the fundamental role in image processing and puzzles. So now we go to continuous symmetry. So now the same question. What are, oh, I should ask the question. What are the symmetries? <laughs> There's the answer. Well, of course, you can rotate through any angle. So now continuous means you can continuously vary it. So the rotation angle is continuous. You can go through any angle, and it doesn't. So unlike the square where you only had discrete angles, now you have continuous angles. And there's also reflections through any axis like that. And for the more mathematically inclined, there are other important symmetries. An important one that comes up in, in things like relativity and also in complex analysis or conformal inversions. There's an example. I'm not going to try to graph that, but it's related to the Escher that I showed you just before. So there's, there's quite a lot of examples. And one of my mathematical heroes and the person who in, pretty much invented the theory of continuous symmetry groups is a, a Norwegian mathematician named Sophus Lee. So that's pronounced Lee, not Lie. I've been asked. <laughs> by, uh, by non-mathematician. You work in lie groups, right? <laughs> groups of people who lie to each other. <laughs> what is the math of it? No, this is lie groups. And, and so in the 19th century, he was very interested in, in solving differential equations, as most of the experts in the audience know. And these are, these are examples of groups that are known as lie groups. And there's a nice picture of lie. Um, but so. But now you start thinking, and my question, original question, what is the symmetry group, was not really well formulated. And that's one of the things I want to. So here's a way to continuous, a continuous symmetry group of a square. So we said it only has discrete rotations, but actually that's not quite true. 
So for example, I could deform a square into a circle. For instance, if you thought of this as a balloon and you inflate it, you get a sphere. Okay. And then I could rotate the circle by any number of degrees. And then, of course, if I know how to go this way, I know how to go backwards. So there are continuous symmetries of squares. They're not usually used, but, but, and they're not usually referred to, and they're not intuitively what we think of as symmetries, but they are there. So as mathematicians, we don't like, pro we don't like questions that are imprecise. What is the symmetry group of an object is an imprecise question. And so what one has to do is you have to specify in advance what are the allowable transformations in your symmetry group. So what do you allow? So there's some underlying transformation group. It might be infinite dimensional. Uh, so this is given to you a priori. And now this is a perfectly legitimate definition. A symmetry of a subset, so that's the object, is an allowable transformation that preserves it. And now the question is well defined. So you specify in advance what you allow, and now you have the object, what among the allowed transformations is a symmetry. So, so examples of allowable transformations are, th well, we'll meet up with more, with more of them later, are things like uh, uh, rotations. Say, say rigid motions would be an example of allowable transformations. So those are rotations and maybe reflections and translations. So here's... So one last question. So now I'm going to pose the question, what is the symmetry group? So this is, my, this is a tiling, like at the Alhambra, so now we'll get back to that. So when we discuss the 17 wallpaper groups, we have, in the back of our mind, said the allowable transformations are rigid motions. We're only allowed to translate and rotate, maybe reflect as well, but nothing more complicated, no conformal funny stuff in the Alhambra. Okay. So what are the allowable transformations here? So this is just mathematical notation, but we can pick this out, right? So if this, is, this is a tiling. So there's translations, right? I can move this without changing it. So there's translations in the vertical direction. There's also diagonal translations, but those are kind of combinations of horizontal and vertical. There are, oh, so this is, these are the allowable ones. And so the answer is that you get this fourfold rotation group by 90 degrees, 180, 270, and the identity, of course. And then these are the translations. So you get translations and rotations, but now it's a discrete group. All right. But now I'm going to throw a little monkey wrench into the system. This is a picture of my bathroom floor. Well, it's not really, or else I would show you a real photograph. But the, but the pictures of the Alhambra were real photographs. This is what I was actually showing you. I was showing you a small part of this. OK. So now, because of the way I've arranged it, or because of the design of my bathroom floor, there are no longer any symmetries. I can't translate, because I go off the edge. I can't rotate because the two arms are different, and I can't reflect for the same reason. So the symmetry group has disappeared. And yet, if you ask the person on the street, if you ask the non-mathematician in the audience, or you go to the Alhambra and you ask those students to do it, they're not looking at infinite tilings. They're looking at just a piece of a tiling on a wall. And so in a sense, their answer should be, there are no symmetries of these tilings, uh, or very few, much fewer than you detect. So, but we still think of this as symmetrical, intuitively. So here's one of the things that I've been thinking about recently. I don't have anything really deep to say about it, but I have written one paper about it. The set of symmetries that come up here are what I would call local symmetries. So if I go back to here and just look at a part of this, it looks like there are definitely symmetries. But if I go to the full global object, there aren't symmetries. And so I'll define a local symmetry so this is the mathematical definition, but what you do, a local symmetry is you just draw a little, little, say, circle around part of your figure, and you ask, when can you move that to another part and still have the same thing? So there are still local symmetries in this object. There are no longer global symmetries. So this object were global symmetries, and the set of local symmetries form a more general object the mathematicians refer to as a groupoid. So I think, for many purposes, Studying objects with variable symmetry, suppose you have twinned crystals or something like that, the right context, and also in the image processing we're going to be looking at, the right framework is groupoids. And if you ask, so this is, this is the most abstract definition I know, 
Uh, if you're a category theorist, you know what this means, but I think, no one, are there any category theorists in the audience? You can ask them what that means. But more, more down to earth, a groupoid is just a collection of arrows. And the important thing about groupoids is you're not always allowed to multiply. So in a group, you can always multiply. In a groupoid, an element of a groupoid is like an arrow. And so H goes from this point to this point, and G goes from this point to this point, and I'm only allowed to multiply G times H if the target or the end of H matches the source of G. And then I get a, and if you know that, and you know what the axioms of group are, you can write down the axioms of groupoids. Um, this is for the experts in the audience. If you've done calculus and you've worked with Taylor polynomials or Taylor series, you've worked with groupoids. The, the composition of Taylor series of polynomials when you do it algebraically is an example of a groupoid because you can't always compose them algebraically. The target of one has to be the source of the other. And so this is very important in, in the theory that I've been quite interested in recently. All right, so before I get on to the next part of the talk, let me, what time did I begin for the, so I don't want to go over who's, Anyone paying attention to the time? <laughs> I think about quarter two, something like that. Okay. So, so what are the symmetry groupoids? So again, the group is rigid motions, translations, rotation. So if you look at one of the corners, then so draw just a little circle around here. Where can you move that to? Well, you could move it to this corner or this corner or this corner, but you can't move it to somewhere else. So the corners still have the rotations in their symmet local symmetry groupoid. The sides are more interesting because if you draw a little circle around a point on the side, you can slide that over and you still have a nice straight edge. So you can keep sliding it in this direction, but you can't go off the edge. And that, but you could also take it and move it down to this by rotating it. So there's, so there's very interesting structure going on with these symmetry groupoids that I don't fully understand. And in particular, the later parts of the talk, I really don't know how to generalize them to groupoids. All right. Now, we're going to, remember I said, to specify symmetry, I had to specify an underlying group of what I allowed. What were the allowable transformations? In other words, what is the allowed transformation group? So let's give examples. So we've already met most of these. So there's translations where you just move in a direction and you get the same object. So now I'm no longer talking about symmetry. So this object is moved onto this object, and we're going to talk about what happens then in a second. So examples, translations, we already met rotations. So you just rotate the object. Um, oh, here's a, here's a good example I like to, to show for those who haven't seen it. So if you, I forgot to bring my book up here, but if you have a book in front of you, you can do this experiment at home. So if you take a book, you can do it with the cell phone, and you rotate, say, by 90 degrees around that axis, and then 90 degrees around that axis, you get one orientation. But if you do it in the opposite way, I think it's this and this, but <laughs> you have to do this yourself, you get a different orientation. So this is a good example of a non-commutative group. Two-dimensional rotations are commutative, but not three-dimensional rotations are not. And this is why 3D graphics and animation and computer games and movies are, are require some significant mathematics behind them. Reflections we already met up with. We reflect in a mirror. Similarity, scaling. We just change the size without changing the shape. And so a more interesting one is projective transformations. So if I take an object, so think of this as an object in 3D, except I'm here looking at it at an angle. So let me give you a better example than that. So let me ask you, what's the shape of the edge of that coffee cup? Without thinking about it, what's the answer? It's a circle, right? Is that a, that's not a circle. So when you look at a coffee cup or this glass, somehow your mind, your brain, or your visual system knows that it's looking at a circle, but it's at an angle. So somehow your brain is doing a projective transformation. That's what I said is going on when you project a 3D object onto a 2D, your 2D retina. So somehow your brain knows this is a circle even though it's, it's an ellipse, it's not a circle. Okay, so there's some 
underlying projective transformation group going on in it. And one of the things in image processing, if we, I mean, image processing, there's been a lot of work on it, but it still in many ways is in primitive shape. We can do things very easily that a computer has, has no way to do. So for instance, for me to pick out faces and know who I know in the audience, who I don't know in the audience, just even finding the faces in, in the picture that I see is something that, that we're getting better at with computers, but we're still a long way from uh, doing. Anyway, so this is something that we do automatically without thinking about it. And in fact, in, in art, uh, this was something, in, at least in the Europe, uh, European culture, was understood at the end of the Middle Ages in the Renaissance. This is a picture of Albrecht Dürer, and maybe not as well appreciated. The, the, the artists of that era liked these, these devices, enabled them to figure out the art. So this was figuring out perspective, and basically they were figuring out the geometry of the projective group. So he's taking this lute, I guess it is, and projecting it through this optical device onto a flat plane, and then I, I, I think that's Dürer, and that's the assistant. And Dürer is busily painting the lute and then, of course, throwing away the equipment, hiding the equipment, so he looks like he's done a brilliant job of painting, of painting the lute. Okay? And so this is another example from another uh, uh, website of, of, of just the projective group. So the projective transformations will, will, will play a role in, in what I'm going to say. Okay? Now, in the middle of the 1800s, a very good friend of Sophus Lee named Felix Klein, a German mathematician, proposed this, what's, what we refer to as the Erlanger program, and he said that geometry was group theory. So not just symmetry was group theory, but all of geometry was group theory. And so what he said, each type of geometry is founded on a transformation group. So when you do Euclidean geometry in uh, high school, you know, you're looking, the underlying group is the group of rigid motions, translations and rotations. Or you can do mirror geometry, you allow reflections into it as well. So you could ask for, so in 3D, we do rigid motions. Well, if, well of course, with our hands, we don't do rigid motions. But with an object like this, we, do, we can do rigid motions, but we can't do reflections in 3D physically. We can look in a mirror, but we can't, can't do it physically. Um, if you allow scalings, then you get into something called similarity geometry. So in, in high school, when you do all these things about angles and similar triangles, you're doing similarity geometry. Or projective geometry, what we just showed with the coffee cup and Dura, is that's allowing all projective transformation. So every group that you can devise, every transformation group carries with it a geometry. Vice versa, if you're doing a geometry, there is an underlying group to do it. So that's Klein's philosophy, which is, uh, which is part of it. So now I want to get to the main theme and the, what's going to lead to the eventual reassembly of some broken objects, the equivalence problem. So we're given a group. So pick your favorite group. So to follow along, pick one of these groups, maybe just rigid motions is a simple example. And now the question is, suppose I give you two shapes. When are they related by a group transformation? Okay. So of course one can do different versions of this. If you, have, if you allow similarity transformations, a big triangle is equivalent to a small triangle of the same shape. If you only allow rigid motions, they're no longer equivalent. The small one is different than the big one. Okay? So, when are they related by a rigid motion? How can you tell? Well, one way, of course, is to just move this object around in all possible ways and see if it matches up that object. And in fact, that's been done in computer vision, the so-called Procrustes method. Is Procrustes was where they kind of forced Procrustes into a bed and they chopped bits of him off to make sure he fit in the bed. So this is, that's what they refer to. So you move it around until you get the best fit. Um, here's an example. So these are two tennis rackets. So of course one is being viewed head on, the other is being viewed at an angle. So there is, so these are certainly not rigidly equivalent, but they may be projectively equivalent. So recognizing that, that's, that's quite a bit harder than recognizing rigidly equivalent. Also, if we go back to symmetries, there is a reflectional symmetry of this one. That's pretty easy to detect uh, 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 by computer. This one is much more subtle, the, the fact that there's a reflection symmetry here, because it's not an ordinary Euclidean reflection, it's a projective reflection. 
So you can see even, so the Euclidean case is not so bad, although a lot of the examples I'll give will be based on the Euclidean problem, but you can very easily get the things that are more interesting. And in fact, there are, there are very interesting limitations to what goes on, particularly with projective equivalence. So here's an example. Is a duck equivalent to a rabbit? Well, the answer is obviously not, at least not the ducks and rabbits I know. But there's a very famous paper by a Swedish uh, engineer named, I, I think it's Ostrom, is something right, like the right pronunciation. And he showed how to change a duck into a rabbit by a projective transformation. So this is the way it goes. So remember, projection is you look at things at an angle. So you take your duck, starting here, and you start tilting it and moving it close to your eyes. That's all allowed in the projective group. And it becomes basically a circle with a tiny bit of noise, which is all the features of the duck, concentrated way out here. But what I didn't show you on the original duck was there was also a tiny little bit of noise somewhere around here that has now made a little bit of an appearance. And now I'm going to tilt things back the other way so this noise disappears, but this one becomes bigger and bigger. And this noise was exactly designed to be the rabbit. OK? So if I allow a little bit of noise into my equivalence problem, if with projective transformations, almost everything is equivalent. So from an engineering point of view or practical point of view, although projective transformations are very important, they're not used nearly as much as one might suspect. And one often approximates them by other types of transformations that we'll see. So this is an example of the limitations of equivalence and the limitations of the group theory. Here's an even more striking example. So you may say, well, rigid motions, that's no problem. I, don't, I can't do all this fancy stuff with rigid motions. So here's an illusion some of you might know. Um, this is, so you take your favorite politician or your least favorite politician or mathematician or whoever, or friend. So in the original version of this with Margaret Thatcher, the prime minister of Britain back in the early 80s. And here's what you do to Margaret's picture. So you start there, and this is just a rigid motion of rotation by 180 degrees, fine. Now what was done from here to here was the mouth and the eyes were both cut out. So if you look carefully, you, you can see that. And they were individually rotated by 180 degrees. So these are sort of little local rotations. OK, and it looks halfway reasonable. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate this back by 180 degrees. And that's what it looks like. <laughs> so somehow, our brain says, or the projective version of our brain, says, OK, I'm allowing you transformations, but don't, go, don't take it too far. OK, keep the transformations not too far from the identity. OK, so this is the language of groupoids, but what I don't know is how to exploit what I know in groupoids to actually make some progress on understanding this notion of what's too far away from the identity that we want to start changing our notion of equivalence. OK, so that's, that's kind of an open problem I'm thinking about on and off at the moment. OK, so now I want to turn to start to look at the jigsaw puzzles, which is one of the main examples of broken objects. We'll see others that I have, that there's still work going on. So, so now, for, of course, to assemble a jigsaw puzzle, you have to recognize, well, now the question is not, is this piece equivalent to that piece, because they're obviously not, and that's not the point of a jigsaw puzzle, to recognize where the two pieces are entirely equivalent. Some of the cheaper puzzles have pieces that are entirely equivalent, and, and that makes assembling them more challenging in some sense, and certainly for us much more challenging. But what we really want to know is local equivalence. So again, this notion, difference between local and global. So we want to know, is the shape of this edge the same as the shape of that edge up to a rigid motion? Because one could do the jigsaw puzzles by looking them at, uh, at angles and so on. And the mathematical theory says we could, in principle, do that. But in practice, we haven't got that far yet. We're still doing rigid motions. OK, so that's the basic problem, local equivalence of the puzzle pieces. And there they go. Once you recognize their equivalent, you put them together. All right. So let me step back and, and discuss the equivalence problem. And then I'll explain how the local equivalence problem works. And then I'll show you a bunch of pictures and, and what we've been able to do so far. Um, and some other stuff along the way. Yeah, we still got, we're still in good time 
Okay, so the equivalence problem, I already stated, when are two shapes related by a group transformation? Again, we have an underlying geometry or an underlying set of allowable transformations. And as mathematicians realized quite early on to solve this, you have to know invariance. So the solution is based on knowing the invariance. Okay, and they're just quantities that are unchanged by the group transformation. So an invariant is something that doesn't change even though, it get, even though the underlying object gets moved around. So I'm going to give you a lot of examples of invariance. And clearly, if the object doesn't change, if the, uh, sorry, if the two shapes are equivalent, in other words, you move one to the other, then the invariants, they don't change, so the equivalent shapes have to have the same invariance. So that's the basic idea. So the more invariants we know, the better. And if we're lucky, if we know enough invariants, we could actually solve the equivalence problem by doing that. Okay, so let me start out with some simpler invariants that don't involve uh, calculus. It's what I, what I refer to as joint invariants. So an invariant that depends on several points is, is known technically as a joint invariant. So I'll give you examples. And, okay, so first of all, what about rigid motions? So if I have two points and I move them according to a translation or a rotation, the individual coordinates, the positions of the points change, but the distance between them does not change. So the simplest joint invariant between two points is the distance. And in fact, there's a theorem that says that's a complete list of the joint invariants. If I give you any number of points, the distances between the points is a complete set of invariants. Okay, what about similarity geometry? Suppose I allow scaling now. So scaling, of course, distance is not preserved under scaling. If I move the points apart, under a, under a, if I look at them in a magnifying glass, the distance has changed. But then there are invariants. So a simplest scaling invariants under the similarity groups are now ratios of distances. So if I look to the smaller version of this figure, the, ra the individual distances would be changed or the ratio wouldn't change or equivalently, the angles between the, the lines, those don't change. So when you do similarity geometry, similar triangles, everything is based on angles. It's no longer based on distances. Um, what about projective geometry? Well, this one, I actually, I, I derived this using some techniques I'll describe a little bit later. And then I found it was in the literature. So, so this, is, this is actually a nice figure. Those who know about cross ratios will kind of recognize this. For the projective group, there, the simplest joint invariant is actually requires five points. So if I draw five points in this configuration, there are four triangles, A, B, C, and D. And if I take the area of A times the area of B divided by the area of C, the area of the D, that's, the, that's invariant under an arbitrary projective transformation. Okay? And that's a complete list. All right. So now if I have multiple points, let's, let's, go, let's specialize to the distance one. We, we won't do more complicated geometries, but one, this has been studied in a lot of other examples. Suppose I have, say, four points in a square. Then I can talk about the, so the distances are invariant under, under rigid motion. So if I rotate or translate the squares, all these distances are preserved. So I have four distances of one and two distances of the square root of two. And this allows me to construct what's called the distance histogram. And much of, of contemporary computer vision image processing histograms, because they're easy to compute and they're easy to compare, are playing a very, a very big role. So we're going to talk about invariant histograms, in particular the distance histogram. So, so it's just these collections of distances, not in any particular order. That's the histogram. So, if two, points, if two sets of points are equivalent up to a rigid motion, they have to have the same distance histogram because the rigid motion doesn't change the individual distances. Question, does the his distance histogram uniquely determine the set of points? Suppose I give you a distance histogram, is there only one configuration up to rigid motion that determines those points? Well, this is an interesting question and it was only solved quite recently. So a former student of mine, Mimi Boutin, and with uh, another mathematician, Gregor Kemper, in 2004, wrote a very nice paper. And they said, the answer to this question is almost always yes, but there are some exceptions. Generically, on a 
uh, Zariski open subset for the real experts in the audience, that's, that's the set where it's unique. And the rest of them, this algebraic subvariety is where it's. But let me show you. OK, so, so let, me, let me take a poll of the audience. Suppose I give you 1, 1, 1, 1, square root of 2, square root of 2. Is the only way to reconstruct that the square? Who says yes? <laughs> yes, no, nobody's going to vote. <laughs> yes. So the answer here is yes. The distance histogram does uniquely determine. That if I give you those four distances, the only way to put down four points with those distances among them is a square. So you can try playing with it a while. If you go to the paper, you'll find out some more sophisticated methods to do it. OK, so you may say that. So your, your first guess would be the, the counterexamples would be very symmetric, but they're not. So what is a counterexample? So I'll give you a simple counterexample. So here's two configurations of four points. This one I'll call a kite for obvious reasons. This is a trapezoid. And this is the histogram. So there are two square root of twos, one, two, two square root of tens, and a four. And the way you get from this to this is if you disconnect this vertical bar and flip this one over down to here and then reconnect the vertical bar as a horizontal bar, you get that. And those are clearly not rigidly equivalent, but they do have the same distance histogram. OK, so, so the theorem is these are exceptional. They, they have to be in very exceptional configurations for such a result to be true. So one could even ask this question in one dimension. So now the group is just translations. You can't, well, you could do a reflection. I guess you allow reflections. But translations and reflections. So suppose I give you the distance histogram for points on a line. In other words, I just looked at the distances of all the points. Does the distance histogram uniquely determine a set of points on a line up to translation? So I'm not going to poll you. There was a paper published that had a theorem in it that said yes. That in one dimension, it was true. And then what I, I regard as the shortest mathematical paper I know was published, I think, a year later. So I won't give you the original paper. Uh, but here's the, here's the publication. This is basically the entire paper. <laughs> Two sets of points with the same distance histogram, but not equivalent up to a translation. <laughs> so even in one dimension, there are exceptions, which is very interesting. OK. Now, let's see. Oh, so some work we did, and I'll, I'll give you a little application that my wife got involved in, was one thing, I, I'm more interested, instead of discrete sets of points, curves, particularly puzzle pieces and things like that, although we won't use histograms there. And one of the things I did with a student of mine, uh, undergraduate student, Dan Brinkman, was we looked at what happens if you take a curve and you take the distance, you discretize the curve, you sample it by a lot of points, and then you look at all the different distances, what does that converge to? So we know what the answer is involving integrals. And we have a conjecture that there, the limiting curve histogram does uniquely determine the curve, but I have not been able to prove it. I certainly do not have counterexamples to where that's true. So that's an open question. Does that, does that in the limit, does it uniquely determine the curve? Um, so this is my wife, Cherry Shakaban, at the University of St. Thomas. This is a former undergraduate student of hers who's now at Brown University as a PhD student. And this is some work they did recently on distinguishing moles from melanomas. So when she gives this talk, she, she quizzes the audience as to which are moles and which are melanomas. Of course, moles are benign, but you don't want to have a melanoma. And it's, of course, of course, the best way is you go to a specialist and you ask them to evaluate you, but in many regions of the world, this is not so easy to do. And if there were a way to automatically do it, say using an application on a smartphone, that would be very nice. So I wouldn't trust their results so far, but they are intriguing that one might be able to get this. And so they did some examples of distance histograms for the melanomas and the moles. And there are ways to distinguish this that I don't know how to do it. But anyway, if you look at the histograms, they have kind of a different flavor. And that's what they found. And when they looked at them, actually, when you graph them, they look just a mess. But if you look more carefully at the graph, a typical mole one looks something like that, whereas a typical melanoma one has more, uh, more curvature to it, more, more uh, things like that. And so they ran statistical tests on the points of concavity convexity, and they got some reasonably encouraging answers. So again, it's not something I would trust. And of course, the problem with putting an app on a smartphone is it only takes one wrong diagnosis for you to be sued by the person who's dying or has died from the family. So anyway, but this is, this is intriguing. So that's one of the examples I wanted to give. 
Um, now, let's turn to truly smooth objects. So, curved surfaces and so on. So now, we're going to use calculus. And this is what Lee, when Lee came up with Lee groups, continuous groups, he realized that he could do calculus on them. And although calculus to the, to the non-mathematician sounds like really foreboding, to the mathematician, once you can do calculus, things become amazingly easier. Calculus is much easier than algebra and much more powerful in many ways. So, so that's it. So, so let me give you an example of a differential invariant. Again, mathematicians know this well. Um, curvature is something we intuitively know. It's a measure of bendiness of a curve. So in this, in this case, in this curve, this is flat, so this should have small curvature. This part is quite bendy, so it should have a large curvature. Okay. So the official mathem mathematical definition of curvature is you look for the closest approximating curvature, sorry, closest approximating circle to the curve, so-called osculating circle, and then you take one over its radius. So the radius is, so the smaller the circle, the larger the, cur the curvature. Small circles have large curvature, large circles have small curvature, straight line has zero curvature. Okay. Now, that's the mathematical definition. Here's another quiz for the audience. Which everyday device that almost all of you have used recently <laughs> do you use to measure curvature? Any guesses? One of my talks, one of the high school students, or maybe it was a junior high student, came up with the answer before I showed you the hint. Anybody got any idea for a thing that, ah, I see somebody making the right motion. Aha. Uh -huh. So he made a motion. He had something to do with driving. <laughs> and, right, the steering wheel, that's what you were <laughs> indicating. <laughs> so when we drive around, the steering wheel, the amount we turn the steering wheel measures the curvature of the road. The more curved the road is, the more we have to turn the steering wheel. So, so uh, everyday device for measuring curvature is a steering wheel. And you just measure, you could measure just say the angle. You put a piece of tape in the vertical thing. Actually, you could have an instrument in your car. It'd be very easy for the engineers to put this in. I don't know if it'll catch on, but you have a little dial that measures curvature instead of, instead of just speed. Okay? So there's an example. So here's the car driving around this racetrack. This is, this is act an actual graph. And as it drives around, so you see curvature has a sign in two dimensions. So these are, so we take a convention that when it curves this way, it's positive. When it curves back the other way, it's negative. So this big dip is this, this little bit here where it's highly negatively curved. And then it goes to this where it's flat over here. There's almost no curvature. And then there's another curvy bit here. Curve back the other way is there. Okay, so there's a graph of curvature versus time. Suppose I give you that graph. Can you reconstruct the racetrack? Who thinks you can reconstruct the racetrack? Anyway. Cruise, control. Cruise control. Okay, well, you're getting close to... So, so the answer is, is staring at you. The problem is the axes of this. One of the axes is time. I can drive fast or I can drive slow around that racetrack, and I'll have different graphs. So time, that graph, if I don't tell you what the time units are, especially if you're driving at variable speeds, that's not going to be very helpful. But if you replace time by the odometer, the distance, then the answer is yes. So if I give you curvature as a function of distance or the odometer, so you have the two dials, you have the odometer and you have the, this new curvature dial that we've installed in our car and we just keep track of those, then in principle, we could almost reconstruct the racetrack. Now, there's one little issue. So, so let me introduce some mathematicians like Greek letters. So cap is the usual letter for curvature. This is a Greek K. And S is a good letter for distance, is the so-called arc length. So this is the graph, curvature versus distance. And the only problem with that, I mean, it's not a serious problem, is the car could start out at different points on the racetrack. So these are both the same racetrack in a up to rigid motion, but the graphs are a bit different because this one hits the highly negatively curved part much quicker than this one. This one has to go around here before it gets. So there's still a bit of ambiguity 
in there. So it's not quite uniquely determined, although there's a very f classical theorem that says you can reconstruct the racetrack from this graph. The only thing you don't quite have is, it, uh, well, it has that and the initial position. So some time ago, about 20 years ago, uh, in work that I'll refer to in a second, we proposed getting rid of that last ambiguity and instead of graphing curvature, we're going to graph the rate of change of curvature. In, I mean, instead of arc length, we're going to graph the rate of change of curvature or the, what's called the derivative of curvature. So you measure not just the curvature, but how fast or slow the curvature is varying as you drive around this racetrack. And I'm going to allow you to drive at any variable speed. The only two things I need to know at each point are the curvature and the rate of change. So I no longer need the arc length. I no need, longer need to know the starting position. I just need this. And then there's a theorem that says that this does uniquely also uniquely determines the racetrack, at least for sufficiently non-degenerate. There's, there's a technical hypothesis. So this is what I came to call the invariant signature of a planar curve. It's the set traced out. So here's the original curve. You think of the car driving around. And as it drives around, you get the invariant signature. Let's see. Do I, yeah, here's the movie. I think I gotta do something to start the movie. Or does this movie automatically start? No, it automatically starts. So there's, there's the car driving around and there's this. I've, I've blown up the picture a bit, so it sometimes goes off the edge. It just means that it's way out there and coming back in. So there's it. And then the theorem is that that does uniquely determine the racetrack up to uh, rigid motion. In fact, it's a it's a special case of a general theorem. So two regular curves are related by a group transformation if and only if they have the same invariant signatures. Now, I showed you in the Euclidean case, but there's also a theorem for the projective case. There's also a theorem for other types of groups. The same thing works. And this is the paper that we wrote in 1998 where we proposed this as a means of recognizing objects in uh, images. And this is a special case of a theorem by another one of my mathematical heroes, Elie Cartan, who was a, a French mathematician in the first half of the 20th century. And he said shapes are related if and only if they have the same relationships among their differential invariants. So curvature and its derivative are two very simple examples of differential invariants. And it turns out those are the only two you need to know to solve the equivalence problems. OK, there's some technicalities in here. So this is not, uh, don't quote me on the theorem exactly. Go to the, the papers to get the right one. So oh, the, here's regular. So the, hidden under the rug is a little thing. And this is an advertisement for what Artemio mentioned, this theory of moving frames. All of the stuff that I'm saying right now is based on this new equivariant method of moving frames, which gives you a systematic and algorithmic calculus for constructing all sorts of invariant objects, not just differential invariants and joint invariants, but all sorts of invariant things mathematicians love, invariant conservation laws, invariant numerical algorithms, invariant signatures. And here's a little bit more advertisement. This is the original paper from 1999, submitted in 1998, so we're almost up to 20 years. And Liz Mansfield wrote a, wrote a wonderful book uh, where she gives other different applications of the method of moving frames, and I, I recommend that highly. Okay, I'm not going to go through this. So this is per perhaps the most mathematical slide, and then the rest of the remaining 15 minutes, I'll show you pictures of jigsaw puzzles. Um, so there are other sorts of invariant signatures. If you do curves in three dimensions, which we will in a second, you need curvature and its rate of change, its derivative, and something called torsion, which is how much the curve twists. If you do surfaces, you need, need things known as the mean curvature and Gauss curvature. And there's actually a new result that says that you actually only really need the mean curvature. Anyway, so the theory is in good shape. The practicalities, in most cases, uh, there's, there's some important practical issues. So let me show you some sample signatures. So you can start to recognize geometry of curves from their signatures. So so this is an original curve. We would say this curve looks almost like a circle. Now, if it were an exact circle, the curvature would be constant, and we would just have a point. Its rate of change would be zero. So if we're driving the car around a circular racetrack, everything is constant. OK, if it's almost circular, the signature is very close to being constant. It's very small. Now, I'm not going to do any numerical analysis here, but all of what I'm showing you is based on these invariant numerical algorithms. And this was just a check that these that the numerical version is close 
vision one. When we work with images, everything has to be numerical. It's all pixels anyway. Okay, here's an example of a curve with an almost threefold symmetry. So the signature actually gives you a good handle, not just on the equivalence, but also the symmetries. So if it were an exact threefold symmetry, you'd go exactly three times around the curve. But because it's only approximate, then, then you have this almost uh, threefold symmetry. And I didn't introduce this, but this is an approximation to projective transformations that doesn't have all the bad properties of the duck and the rabbit. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that curve and look at it at an angle. So a non-rigid motion, and what you'll see is the Euclidean signature changes quite dramatically, but the equiaffine signature has not changed at all. Okay, so this would tell you those two curves are equivalent under an equiaffine or projective transformation, but they're certainly not rigidly equivalent. So the tennis racket, that's kind of the things we would look at if we want to understand the symmetries of the tennis racket. Um, here's another project, another student of mine, this is, this is again 20 years ago, so these are some practical images of, of uh, hardware. So here we have two images of a nut with a fourfold or eightfold symmetry if you allow reflections. And you see that coming out in the signatures. Because they're almost fourfold on top of each other, you have the symmetry. And because these two signatures are very close, these are close to being equivalent. Whereas these two are very different and a different set of equivalent. And also Cherry and the same student did some work on using this to try to diagnose breast tumors based on basically the geometry, computing the signatures. And what they found, I won't go into details, is the signature of the malignants tended to be much more complicated than the signatures of the benign tumors. So there's some possibilities there. Okay, so finally, what do I have left? About 10 minutes, good. Let me show you about the title of the talk. This has all been a build up to the title, but as I said, I didn't give you the real title because I didn't want to scare the audience away. Um, so this is what we already saw. And so this is basically the algorithm. So I had, I had a very brilliant undergraduate student named Daniel Hoff. And we worked on one paper which was a more theoretical bent. And he had like two, maybe three months left in his undergraduate career before he went off to do a PhD, which he has since done. He's now a postdoc at UCLA. Uh, he unfortunately didn't stay in image processing. He went into operator algebras, but that's a different story. Um, anyway, he was looking for a project to do the last three months, and I'd run across uh, some papers. Uh, actually, Irina Kogan, another student of mine, had written some papers with, about jigsaw puzzles, and I started looking at the literature. I said, well, take a look at jigsaw puzzles. Let's see if we can do anything. And I wasn't expecting much, especially in three months, and somehow he just, well, I found out later he was a fanatic jigsaw puzzle solver when he was a kid, so that helped. But he just, he just took this and ran with it. So, so first of all, he went out and bought a puzzle. I'll show you the puzzle in a second. Actually, two puzzles. I'll show you one of them. And digitally photographed it. In fact, the first set of photographs he took weren't accurate enough, so he realized he had to get pretty accurate photographs. And then there's a question, because we're computing things like curvature, we, we, we can't work with jagged edges. So there's some smoothing issues, which I can tell afterwards if anyone's interested. Then we compute the invariant signatures, but because we're only interested in matching locally, matching parts of them, I'll tell you in a second what parts we mean, we're going to compute signatures of parts of the edges of the pieces. We compare the signatures to find potential fits, and then we put them together if they do fit as closely as possible, and then we repeat until the puzzle is assembled. And the bits that we look at are something that we named, because I haven't seen a term in the literature, bivertex arcs. So it's just an arc on the curve which the rate of change of curvature is not zero, except at the endpoints, or in signature language, it's just one arc of the signature. Okay, so what we do is we chop up the edges of the pieces into these bivertex arcs, and then we compare those, and we look for potential matches. Okay, and the way we compare them is this turned out, there's many ways to compare metrics for comparing curves. The one we liked was based on treating the curves as electrically charged wires and looking at the mutual repulsion. So that's kind of the technical details. And then this was all Dan's idea. We realized pretty early on, so he started to get some halfway decent results, but the matches weren't all that great. And it's pretty clear if you start if you start making errors in the matches, the errors propagate and pretty soon you're sunk. 
you're going to get bad matches. So he came up with a method that he called peace locking, which was kind of based on his intuition as a child of putting these together. So it, what he did was he got a good potential match, and then he would wiggle the pieces around, basically, until he made the match as, best, as good as it could possibly be. And the puzzle that he digitized is something you could, I think you can order on Amazon. It's not too expensive. It's called the Baffler Nonagon. It's one of several Bafflers. That's the one we concentrated on. It has 69 pieces, and we really like it because our algorithm doesn't, unlike almost all the other algorithms for jigsaw puzzles, it doesn't require the pieces to be in some standard form, like a rectangle with knobs on it. So we really like this puzzle. Um, so Dan started working on this, and he came back, and he said, oh, I've got a couple of pieces assembled. And then a few days later, oh, I've got five pieces assembled. And he would tinker around with more. There's some parameters to tinker around. I got and suddenly, within a space of a few weeks, well before the end of this three months or two months that he had, he had the whole thing assembled. So with our code, which is you can actually download the MATLAB code,